A new study published in JAMA shows that the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee referenced one randomized controlled trial and 152 observational studies in making their recommendation to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee. Now, what does this mean in terms of the strength of the evidence for these recommendations, and why are they using these observational trials? I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and I think this is so interesting to look into because, you know, knowing the strength of the dietary guidelines, knowing the power that they have in the United States and, to be honest, in the world in general, it's important to know what makes up the evidence and the research that they're citing to come up with their recommendations. Well, this interesting paper published in JAMA, it was very clear about what they were using. It's almost like they were bragging that they used all these observational studies, 152 observational studies, and one randomized controlled trial. Now, we've talked about this many times here at Diet Doctor, and I encourage you to go to dietdoctor.com. We have a whole article about observational um, versus interventional studies. We have a whole thing about how we grade evidence. And it's clear we're not the biggest fans of nutritional epidemiology studies for many reasons. But when I read this paper, I really wanted to try and figure out why are they using nutritional observational studies to make these recommendations? Because let's think about what happens. This is the advisory committee. They then make the recommendations to the, the whole guidelines committee, which then sets the guidelines of what they think the average health, healthy American should be eating from kids all the way up to seniors, what the military get, um, what kids get in school lunches, um, what's on the, the free lunch programs or, you know, um, for women and infants and children, and what do people get in um, retirement homes or rehab facilities or hospitals. Like it, it really has, it's such a pervasive thing, the guidelines. Whereas for one individual free living, it might not mean much, but these guidelines mean a lot for institutions and that trickles down. So you would hope the level of evidence is really strong, but it's not. Now they stated in this paper, the objective was to ascertain the association between dietary patterns consumed and all cause mortality. So that's an important statement right there. Association between dietary patterns and all cause mortality is not cause and effect. It doesn't prove that eating this way results in higher or lower all-cause mortality. Second thing is using all-cause mortality is actually really interesting for an observational study. Now, in the past, I've actually been a big fan of all-cause mortality because if you're just looking at what happens to LDL or what happens to blood pressure, or even if you're looking at what happens to cardiovascular mortality, you want to know, well, what also happens to cancer mortality? What happens to infection mortality? You know, you don't want to lower one risk of dying and increase another risk of dying, right? Like lower the risk of heart disease, but increase the risk of infections. Um, that was seen in these very strong anti-inflammatory medications that did actually lower the risk of cardiovascular events and heart attacks, but increase the risk of dying of infection. So, okay. I mean, that's not such a great trade-off. So you do need to know things like that. All-cause mortality sort of takes it all um, into context. I was talking to uh, Adele Haidt, who's a you know, PhD dietitian, and a senior writer at Diet Doctor, I was, I was talking to her about this study, and she said, yeah, but why do you care who dies in car accidents, right? Who dies um, from gunshot wounds or whatever? Like, that has nothing to do with that, but that's in all-cause mortality. And that brings up the problem with these observational studies because they don't do anything different. They don't intervene in any way. They just follow people about how they live their lives. Well, we know that there is this very strong component called healthy user bias. And if the if the, under arch, the overarching message is meat is dangerous, saturated fat is dangerous, then the people who are going to eat more saturated fat by choice are those who are going to be less interested in the common narrative of health. So will they also be less interested in the common narrative of safety, of wearing your seatbelt, of looking both ways before you cross the street, of not texting and driving, right? All those things get factored into all-cause mortality. So I thought that was a really interesting point that Adele made that you know, it almost seems like we should come up with another metric, um, an all-cause health mortality or an all-cause chronic disease mortality that looks at cancer and neurodegenerative diseases and cardiovascular diseases and, you know, infection risk or whatever the case may be, but uh, eliminates sort of the traumatic or non-associated. So that's the first thing that I thought was a really interesting point by Adele, which, which I hadn't thought about before, but that makes a lot of sense to me. But the other problem is, 
is sort of how they bring these studies together. Because they actually state, and this was really interesting, they state multiple articles use data from the same study, but use different methods or represented unique subsamples or dietary patterns. Okay. So when you're designing a study, you are supposed to say, this is what we are looking for. We are going to measure this and look for this outcome because then it's clear what you're trying to measure. Now, when you use one data set and do tons of different studies, that's called data mining. That's one word for it because you can crunch the data in so many different ways to find any different association. And that's essentially what they did. They used, they used similar data sets and just try to crunch it in all different ways to get many different papers out of it. And look, that's, that's helpful. You can find all sorts of different associations, but they are clearly weak when it comes to scientific evidence. And that's part of the problem that they're treating this like it's such a great a sign of evidence that should be used for dietary guideline recommendations instead of acknowledging how weak it really is. So here's what they probably think is a benefit that they're overcoming that by having so many different studies representing so many different people and being able to follow them for such a long period of time. It's impossible to do that in randomized controlled trials. So if that's what you have, I can see why they say, okay, that's what we should be using to make these recommendations. But if you're making recommendations for what healthy people should be doing, you should have very strong evidence. And if you don't, why do you need to be making recommendations in the first place? If you don't have strong enough evidence to make that recommendation. And that's where I think this really breaks down. Um, where when you're using data sets multiple times, and, and I guess the other thing I should mention, this was truly an international cohort. They said there's studies from Japan and Korea and Norway and the Netherlands and Poland and Portugal and Russia. But for me, what I wanted to see was what population, what number of people was represented by each of these countries. Because my guess is with 53 studies originating from the United States, the majority of the population is coming from the United States. And that's important because when you look at individual trials in the U.S., you're going to have a high percentage of healthy user bias. And stu observational studies have shown this time and time again, that those people who eat more red meat, more processed meats are going to be less healthy in general. But that doesn't always translate to studies in Japan or even studies uh, in some parts of Europe. But if the, if the population represented by the U.S. overwhelms the general population in this review, then that's gonna really play into that healthy user bias, which is something you can't avoid. So they also talk about how the authors tried to account for smoking and for pre-existing disease and for physical activity. And that's a good effort. I mean, it's better probably than not doing it, but still that's not all that scientifically accurate because you're kind of, there's no known factor that you adjust for. You kind of, kind of make your best guess and that's really problematic. But how many other lifestyle factors can you not adjust for? How much sleep you're getting, how you manage your stress, what your social connections are, how often you see the doctor or if you take a vitamin or a supplement, or like I was saying, if you wear your seatbelt or text crossing the street, all, I could list a thousand more, right? But you can't control for all of those. And that's what makes this data so weak. But here's part of the other thing. When you look at smoking and the observational studies of smoking and causing cancer, there was a hazard ratio between like 15 and 30, somewhere in that range. And that's pretty robust. And there are publications that suggest you really shouldn't be interested in an observational study that has a hazard ratio less than two because it's too likely to be complicated by um, artifact, statistical artifact and confounding variables and so forth. So what were the hazard ratios that they compared here? 1.1, 1.2, and as clear as day, they listed it uh, in the paper here. They were the hazard ratios for all cause mortality and the different quartiles of the amount of food you ate, vegetables, fruit, saturated fats, meats, processed meats, it ranged between 0 0.8 for benefit and 1.2 for harm. And that is like razor thin. It doesn't get much smaller than that. So what does that mean for any one individual? It really can't tell. It really doesn't mean much at all for that one individual. And here's the other thing. When they talk about the limitations of the data, they mentioned that in many of these studies that there was a food frequency questionnaire given once. Once. The study could have lasted for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and the food frequency questionnaire was given once. I mean, that, again, the data acquisition doesn't get any worse than that. That is really poor data acquisition to then have such low hazard ratios and then to then take that evidence and make an official recommendation of how people should be eating. It really is frustrating to see this level of evidence and, and feel like people don't get it, right? The scientists kind of don't get it. They're, they're, they, they're promoting this as if it's good science. 
And I'm not sure why that is, except that they don't have much of an alternative. But as I said before, the alternative is you admit you don't have good quality science and then you don't make recommendations like this. So I want to talk about another thing that came up when I was talking to Adele Haidt about this study. She brought up a great analogy. A great analogy. If you're going to study um, the drivers of white Priuses in North Carolina um, and see if they are safer drivers and have less risk of, of accident. But then, you know, right, right away, okay, well, who chooses to drive a Prius versus who chooses to drive a pickup truck or a Camaro or a Ferrari or um, whatever, you choose your car, right? People make that choice for a reason. So already you have a very biased subset of population. But then that was the way you designed your study. But then you're going to say, okay, now we're going to look at this data and say, well, who has heart attacks and who has strokes and who lives or dies and who develops diabetes. And we're going to say whether driving a Prius is good for developing diabetes or heart disease or a stroke, right? And it seems ridiculous to say it, but that is exactly what they're doing in these studies. They're seeing what people choose to do and then trying to relate it to a health consequence, which really just doesn't have any point in this type of a strong guideline. So to be honest, when I set out to make this review, I wanted to kind of talk about the good parts about obser nutritional observational studies and the good reasons of why we can see why the recommendation, the guideline recommendation committee uh, used these studies. And I was really searching and I was really searching and all I can come up with is that there are so many people represented in so many different studies that you would think that, it, oh, it'll just all equal out, that it'll all smooth out and, and all these biases and um, things will just kind of get accounted for, but it doesn't. In fact, it's the opposite. It sort of compounds all the biases because they're all, they're all the same inherent in those studies, um, especially when you talk about US-based studies, industrialized-based studies, um, you know, industrial, industrialized world-based studies of the way people eat and the, the recommendations for what healthy eating has been for so long. So I tried hard to find something um, positive to say about it, but I really can't other than to say this type of evidence should not be used to make recommendations about we should about what we should and should not eat. Which leads us to the conclusion, how do we know what to eat, right? Well, the first and I think most important thing is to acknowledge that we're all different. We all respond differently to different foods. All you have to do is, is look at the CGM data to see that, right? And, and to realize some people have insulin resistance and are gonna respond very different to carbohydrates than people who ha don't have insulin resistance or, in, or are thin and leave active lifestyles. People who eat a high fat and high carbohydrate diet and over consume calories are very different than people who eat a f high fat, low carbohydrate diet and don't over consume calories. People who get adequate protein versus people who don't get enough protein. All of these factors come into play when you're talking about what diet is quote unquote healthy. So how do you know what diet is healthy for you? You measure. Right? We have all this content now at dietdoctor.com about what healthy weight loss means, how to measure healthy weight loss. And it has to do with metabolic health parameters. So your blood sugar, your HDL, your triglycerides, your blood pressure, your waist circumference, your abdominal obesity, not just your total weight, right? But your abdominal weight. Also, how do you enjoy your meals? Are you going to be able to stick with it long term? What does it do to um, how much food you eat, your total calorie content during the day? What does it do to your hunger? That's all part of healthy weight loss. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. So to think we can make a recommendation that's the same for everybody is a little ridiculous. Now, people can accomplish those goals. Some people are going to accomplish that on a keto diet, some on a carnivore diet, some on a moderate, low-carb, high-protein diet, some on a plant-based diet. Um, it's, it's, people can accomplish those goals in different ways, but the only way you can know is by trying it and testing it. And that's a lot harder than saying everybody should eat this way, period, right? That's very simple to say, but it doesn't work. That just doesn't work. The, the harder way to do it is to try something and test it, but it doesn't have to be that hard, right? You can set your goals. You can say, these are the things I'm going to measure. I'm going to eat this way for six weeks, 12 weeks, and I'm going to measure them. And I'm going to see how I do. I'm going to see how the measurements are. I'm going to see how I feel. That's the complicated way, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. So check out our guide to, to healthy weight loss. Uh, check out our guide to you know metabolic health and body composition, all those things that come into play for deciding what is the right dietary pattern for you. Because one, you have to enjoy it. Two, it has to fit with your lifestyle and be logistically doable. And three, it has to improve your health. All right, so that's how you find out what healthy eating is for you. And at Diet Doctor, we wanna help you get there.
Uh, so please check out those guides. And if you thought this was helpful, click the thumbs up and the subscribe button so you'll get updates on all our Diet Doctor news on YouTube. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.